Now we tend to think I'll pour more when I get more, but the way it works in the order of God is it becomes more as it is poured. Isn't it just like God to command you to pour something that you don't feel like you have enough of? I wonder, was the woman a little disappointed that the prophet told her to pour something? It's frustrating when you have to pour into someone else when you really wish someone would pour into you. Yet the more you pour, the more it flows. This week on Connecting the Gap, we're going to finish up our mini-series on miracles. We're going to talk about the miracle of provision. We're going to get back into that right after this. In this world, there are many disconnects that cause chaos in our lives. Connecting the Gap podcast is birthed from the desire to share hope and restoration of the power of the gospel by being transparent and open in our biblical walk with God. This week, let's take a few moments as we navigate God's Word and encourage each other to connect the gap. Welcome to this week's podcast. I'm Daniel Moore, your host, here with a brand new episode this week of Connecting the Gap. Thank you for joining me. Hope you guys have had a great blessed week so far. You can visit my website, connectingthegap.net. There you'll find all the podcasting platforms that I am on. You can also subscribe and share from those locations as well. And I do highly encourage you to do that if you would. As you share these podcasts, you are sharing God's Word with me as we are endeavoring to pour into other people and help them to grow up and, and understand the relationship with Christ and what it's, what it's all about to live for God on a daily basis. So please join in me with that effort and please subscribe and share. You can also uh, get a hold of me. There's a contact page there, and I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to get some feedback on the episodes that I do put out. If you ha- have any suggestions or if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to use that contact page to get with me, to share those with me, and I will get back with you. And if you need a Bible, if you've recently become a Christian and don't have a Bible, I can definitely help you take care of that issue as well. You can also email me at daniel at connectingthegap.net. I would definitely love to hear from you. Well, as we get started this week, I'm excited to share with you part six of our mini series on miracles. It's been really exciting to hear all the different ways that God's been moving within our church. And I know that a lot of you out there listening, he's probably moving in yours as well. There's just lots of miracles and exciting things that God's been doing in our churches and in our families. And it's been exciting just watching him answer prayers and seeing his miraculous work in the lives of our church and the believers. And today we're going to talk about living in a deficit. We're going to talk about the miracle of provision. And let's be honest, as we get started this week, for so many of us, money can be tight at times. I know with my wife and I, as we first got married, we're, we're older now and don't seem to have as much problem as we used to, but especially when our kids were at home, it seemed like a lot of times the week was way longer and much bigger than our paycheck was. And it was very tight many, many times. How many of you out there can say that you know what I'm talking about? For example, you might be a single parent trying to raise three kids, and it seems like there's often so much more month than there is money. Or you may make a relatively strong income, you know, it might be a six-figure income or six figures plus even, and yet you're still working to make ends meet because the expenses are so high. You might be paying off student loan debt, you might have medical debt, got car payments, you've got kids and their activities that kids get involved in, you're doing everything you can just to stay above water. And you know, it can be very difficult in our culture today because money often seems really, really, really tight. Well, I want to walk into this message today and help bring a word of encouragement as we look at different stories of provision in Scripture. The good news is that there are actually countless numbers of stories where people feared that they didn't have enough. And this is the good news, because in every story of need, there is a miracle of provision. 
as we crack open God's Word all through Scripture. Every time you see a story of need, you will almost always certainly see a miracle of provision. Over and over and over again in the Gospels, whenever there's thousands of people who are hungry on a hillside, you know, the disciples in despair, they're crying out to Jesus, what are we going to do? And Jesus says, you feed them. And the disciples say, but we only have some loaves and some fishes. You know, they're looking at what they've got sitting right there in their hands, and they've got a negative attitude about how they're going to perform this miracle and feed all of these people. Well, then Jesus takes the loaves and the fishes. He lifts it up to heaven and blesses them. Then God multiplies and he provides for everyone, even to the point where there are 12 basketfuls left over. And if if you're like me, have you ever wondered, you know, why 12 basketfuls? Why is the number 12 significant there? Well, I've got an opinion on that. My opinion is so that each disciple would have a doggy bag to take home, realizing the miraculous provision of a very faithful God. You know, they were so negative about it from the beginning and in disbelief that it was going to take place. What's a way that God can prove to them that He is God by giving them each an extra bag full of fish and chips that they can take home with themselves to remind them that God is our provider. In the Old Testament, the prophet Elisha was taking a widow who was scared for her future. She didn't feel like she had enough. And the prophet said, what do you have? And she said, well, I don't have much of anything at all. And maybe you feel like this. She said, I simply have a small jar of olive oil. And he asked her to pour that into some containers. And as long as she had containers, God miraculously provided. From very little, he multiplied it to very, very much. Whether it's bread from heaven, whether if it's meat delivered by birds, Maybe it's a giant fish provided to rescue a rebellious man named Jonah. In every story of need, there is miraculous provision. There's a story of a woman who was a single mom, and she always struggled to make ends meet. But this woman deeply believed in God. She would pray out loud all the time, Jesus, I believe you're going to meet my needs. And the neighbors would hear it every day. And there was this one guy who lives next door who hated God. I mean, he utterly just had a hatred for God. And this woman drove him crazy. So finally, one day he said, you know, I'm going to mess with this woman. I'm going to go to the grocery store and buy some groceries. And that's exactly what he did. He put three bags of groceries down on her sidewalk and he hid behind the door. When she came home, she saw the groceries on the front door. She threw up her hands and she said, Jesus, I knew you were going to meet my needs. Immediately, he jumps out and he says, you fool. God didn't provide those groceries. I provided those groceries. God is not good and he doesn't exist. Well, she looked at him and then all of a sudden she threw her hands up in the air again. And she said, oh, Jesus, you're even better than I thought. You provided for my needs and made the devil pay the bill. (laughs) There's some humor in that, but believe it or not, that's some good news. And I want to encourage you in Philippians 4.19, Paul gave some great news to the church in Philippi. In, In those scriptures, he said, and my God will meet what? He will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Do you realize that your God is the giver of all good things? The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from him. And yet, before we dive into this idea of God being a miraculous provider, we have to acknowledge something that we just saw in Scripture, and that is this. God promises to meet your needs. He never promised to provide your wants. He's never once promised that. And yet, we tend to struggle with this idea of God. Where are you? Because we misinterpret what we're expecting Him to do. How many of us know there is a difference between what we need and what we want? For example, we need clothes to wear, but what we want is the limited edition Adidas Ultra Boost. Like, that's what we want. We have issues with them. We love those shoes. And then we need rest. But what we want is 14 days at an all-inclusive resort looking over an emerald blue ocean. You know, my wife would say amen to that right there. She loves the ocean. And I get it. We need a house. We need shelter of some kind to live in. What we want is a mid-century farm home designed specifically by Chip and Joanna Gaines. You know, nothing too big or too fancy, (laughs) but that's not necessarily what we need. And there is a difference. One of the things we can learn this week is where God guides, He always provides.
When God is the one guiding you, his provision is always following. Isaiah 58, 11 is a super rich verse. The Lord will guide you always, right? So as he's guiding you, what's he going to do? Well, then he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. When everything around you is barren, the God of the universe is going to provide your needs when you're being led by him. But understand this, he doesn't provide for your dreams, and he doesn't respond to your ambitions. He simply provides for his will. And when you're walking in sync with his will and purpose, his provision will always, always be there. Some of you might think, God, where are you? God, I've got a mortgage payment that's due at the same time that my car payment is due. I planned a vacation that I felt led by the Spirit to book, not knowing how I was going to pay for it. And I've yet to pay off Christmas of 2021. Where are you, God? We need to understand something. Is it possible that God has provided your needs, yet you took the provision and spent it on your wants? I'm going to get inside of our business a little bit today because here's the thing. God's provision is not a get-out-of-jail-free card for our stupid financial decisions. It just isn't. And I just believe that God is calling us back to this place of understanding what His promises are and just letting those flow into our lives. One of my favorite examples in the Old Testament is a story of a man named Abraham. You may not be familiar with the story, but Abraham and his wife Sarah ached and longed for one thing, and it was a child, a son. And the son was the promise of God that Abraham would become the father of many nations. So day after day, Abraham and Sarah, they prayed and they waited. Year after year, they prayed and they waited. Decade after decade, talk about faith, they prayed and they waited. And finally, the promise comes in the birth of a baby boy, Isaac. And God puts Abraham to the test. He says, Abraham, take your son to the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice. Now remember, how long has he waited for this boy? And God, you want me to take him up and sacrifice him? Well, just imagine the walk up that mountain. Isaac has seen his father sacrifice and worship God before. He's carrying the wood. He knows what's happening. Isaac asks his daddy, where is the sacrifice, dad? And Abraham responds in Genesis 22, verse 8, and he says, God himself will provide the lamb. You see that faith? So they go up the mountain, and they build an altar. Courageously and faithfully, Abraham lays his son on the altar, ties him down, and lifts a knife. Now, in our culture, none of this makes sense to us. At this time, it was a totally different story. And the moment his knife goes up, the Bible says that an angel appears and says, Don't lay a hand on that boy, for I know now that you fear God. Now, here's where the provision comes. Verse 13 of Genesis 22, Abraham looked up, and over in the thicket, he sees a ram caught by its horns. How convenient. (laughs) He went over and took the ram. He sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham named this place, this mountain, Jehovah-Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. What do we know? Abraham was fixed on the will of God. He was fixed on it. He answered his son before he even reached the top. I know my God will provide the lamb himself. What we often struggle with, if we're honest, is not being fixed on God, but being fixated on what we lack. And if that's the lens you're looking at your life through, you're going to see what you describe as an unfaithful God, when he has always been true to keep his promises. When God is the one guiding you, his provision is always there. You're going to have moments where you fear, moments where you freak out, but his provision is always there so long as he's leading you and you are obeying. Do you ever give God praise for what he is doing in your life? It's amazing. When God guides, he always provides. Another thing we need to learn is that God miraculously multiplies what is given. It is a miracle how God works. Now, sometimes God is going to do it all by himself. He doesn't need you like he doesn't need any of us. So sometimes he's going to save Jonah single-handedly. You know, you're drowning. I'm going to send a fish. It's going to swallow you and you'll be fine. Sometimes the Israelites are out in the wilderness and God decides, you know what? I'm going to put a Panera bread right in heaven and drop bagels down. Of course, we know they weren't bagels, but it was bread. And for those of you that are new to the faith, there literally wasn't a Panera in the sky, but bread did fall from heaven. 
God's like, I got this. But sometimes God wants to build your faith. Sometimes God invites you to be a part of his miracle. When does he do it? How does he do it? He simply asks you to give. And then what does he do? Miraculously, he multiplies what you give. Think about the three stories that we talked about earlier in the episode. The widow pours out the oil. When did the multiplication happen? Was it before she poured it or as she poured it? When did the loaves and the fish multiply to feed the multitude on the mountainside? Not before, as the little boy said, Jesus, you can have my lunch. When did Abraham become the father of many nations? Many argue it was the moment that he offered to God his first and only son. This is a miracle on the adventure of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Do not listen to the things that I'm saying as though this is a prosperity theology that if you sow this seed, it will give you like $100 today if you're going to go out in the parking lot and your 96 Corolla is now a Mercedes G-Wagon. Don't think it's like that. If that does happen, you need to put that on Instagram because you would get a ton of likes. But I'm telling you, that's not going to happen. That's not what this is. What this is, is a miracle of God's multiplication, and He's simply inviting you to be a part of that miracle. What do we know? Our God always miraculously multiplies what is given. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, this generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, which becomes bread for our meals, multiplication is already happening. It's even more extravagant towards you. First, He supplies every need plus more. Then He multiplies the seed when... As you sow it. If you multiplied it before we sowed it, it wouldn't require any faith. And the whole point of this is for us to grow our faith. So God multiplies it as we sow it. So this week we will talk about the miracle of provision. And I've mentioned a couple of times about the woman that had little oil. I want to use this passage of scripture this week to discuss when we feel we have a deficit, but God says we have enough. Our scripture this week is 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I want to speak to someone who is in a deficit in an area of your life. The more I become exposed to, I'm convinced there are many different varieties of poverty. And so you can be rich financially and broke emotionally. You can be rich financially and broke relationally. You can have a lot of responsibility and not a lot of joy. Or you can have a lot of joy and not a lot of influence. And so I've learned that poverty, although we tend to associate it with finances, can be a poverty of a different kind. Some people come to church and take the bus. Some people come in a Hummer to the same church. And so you can feel on the surface like you can't teach the same message sometimes to the person who is in the top tax bracket and maybe the person who hasn't had a job for two and a half years. But you learn over time as you study people and pay attention that everybody has a deficiency. And really inside, we're not all that different. The reason I like this text from 2 Kings 4 is because it seems like a small little practical, almost incidental miracle on the surface. But understanding the surrounding context in the life of the prophet Elisha, he just finished solving a problem for three kings. Right after this, he performs a great miracle for a very wealthy woman. And sandwiched right between these two magnificent miracles on a grand scale, where he's consulting political advisors like a real prophet would, and where he's hanging out with a top donor, there's something that happens that seems so small on the surface. And that's where our discussion is going to be this week in 2 Kings 4, 1 through 6. And I hope to be able to share it to you the best I know how. So let's read the scripture together, and we'll discuss it a little bit. In verse 1, it says, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, My husband is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in situations that are not the result of our disobedience. Have you noticed that life doesn't make allowances for your crises? That the universe doesn't send out a memo when you're having a bad day? You know, hey, everybody, be nice to her today. Her mom is sick. You know, it would be nice if life's demands would accommodate my crises, but they don't. And so the bills were still due, although the woman did not have the means. And so this creates a sense of deficit, a very desperate deficit in her life, as it turns out. And this crisis is not a national crisis. It's just a personal crisis. But the man of God takes time for one woman, just like he took time for three kings. 
And I love that he's not just presiding over a royal wedding across the pond somewhere, but he's right up in your life while you're crying at night, while you're trying to figure out how to build your own relationships. God is into that. So she comes with this need, which probably seems small in the scope of a big, bad, important prophet who's commanding kings, but she comes to him boldly and she says, your servant, my husband is dead and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? So here, it sounds like he's about to get out his checkbook, but then he makes this weird move where he answers this question with a question. He says, tell me, what do you have in your house? She said back, your servant has nothing there at all. You know, she's looking at a lie. She's saying, you know, that's, that's why I'm coming to you. If I had something to put on eBay, I would have done it by now. Do I need to back up and take it from the top? I told you nothing except a small jar of olive oil. Verse 3, and Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Here again, she's got to be probably looking at him saying, you know, this dude can't hear. He's good at talking, but he can't hear. I don't need jars. I need oil. I'm broke. I don't need something to put nothing in. Or do you? See, in the beginning when God created the world, it was without form and void. And the first thing that God did was to form it before he filled it. Here in verse 3, go around asking all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her, and her sons, they brought the jars to her. She kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. You know, if we read that verse in King James Version, verse 6, it says, And it came to pass when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. So if there are many varieties of poverty, and if the abundance of our life really consists in the flow, you know, like Jesus said, From your belly will flow rivers of living water. Or like it says in Proverbs, that from your heart flows the issues of life, so you got to guard it. It is instructive that Elisha the prophet, in performing his first miracle, cut off the flow of the Jordan River. First thing he did when he became a prophet was to grab the mantle that fell off of Elijah, who, by the way, he was known for giving strange commands as well. When he called the false prophets up to Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18.19, it's amazing because the people were in a drought. And he said, whichever God answers by fire is the true God, because he was challenging their idolatry. And when he got up there on the mountain, before he called down fire, he made them pour water on the wood, because sometimes God will make a situation seem impossible to men, so that when fire falls and the wood starts to burn, you won't think it was because of the quality of the firewood, but it's because of the power of God. Now, if you got wet wood in your life today, you can rejoice because God is setting you up to do something so special, and he wants all the credit. So he allows this woman to get down to seemingly nothing. Do you notice that her first instinct when the prophet says, what do you have in your house, is to say nothing? Her first instinct is to minimize what little bit she has left. Now, we can't prove this. It's not in the text, but just imagine with me. You know, the prophets are weird. Maybe Elijah asked her that same question, and when she started to answer, maybe he made eye contact with her. You know, awkward eye contact. You got anybody in your life who has really low relational skills? People that have no concept of personal space? You know, you got what they call close talkers in your life? You know, some people just look at you a little too long and a little bit too hard. Eye contact is good, but it can come to a point where it's a little awkward. She says, nothing. And he just waits. He's like, really? Nothing? Because sometimes we get so overwhelmed by our scarcity that we minimize our supply. We're going to take a break here for a moment. We're going to come back here in just a little bit, and we're going to continue this discussion this week on the miracle of provision, and we're going to be back right after this.
Today on Principles for Living, author and Christian businessman Bill Zekman shares advice on everyday living. Jesus taught us that we're to love others as ourselves. As an employer, I've found myself in situations where I've needed to fire someone. It's not something I've ever wanted to do. It's not something I've always done the right way either. How do we lovingly give someone bad news? Giving someone bad news is like taking something away from someone. That's because it usually takes away self-respect or security and often reveals the coming of unwanted change. Remember, love always considers the feelings of the other person. The next time you get ready to deliver bad news to someone, consider what it takes to help that person maintain self-respect and still feel secure and also be willing to face the changes that are coming into their lives. Receive Bill Zekman's free booklet, The Hidden Kingdom, when you call 888-881-3411. That's 888-881-3411. Welcome back to Connecting the Gap podcast. I'm Daniel Moore, your host for this week. And if you've been with me here for the first 25 minutes or so of this week's episode, you'll know that we are finishing up our mini series on miracles this week as we're talking about the miracle of provision, living in a deficit. We've been talking about the the woman that had just a little bit of oil And she came to the prophet Elisha and she told him that that her creditors were after her and they were going to be taking her sons and she was needing a miracle. And so Elisha had her get jars and fill them up with the oil, which she was very skeptical about at first. And as we have continued this uh, little story here in the Bible this week, as we're talking about the miracle of provision, the first thing that we see in the miracle is that Elisha instructs this woman who is at a deficit to check her oil. You know, maybe today we need to check our oil. It is possible that you are overlooking the very thing that God wants to perform a miracle through. When you've lived in a deficit long enough, it can be difficult to appreciate the supply that you have especially when you've lost a lot. She lost a husband. She spent almost everything. She's got one little jar of oil. She's got one little bit of oil, and it's so little. In fact, the oil is so small that she doesn't even think it's worth mentioning. God is about to do a miracle through something that you don't even think is worth mentioning. Something so small and insignificant in your sight that your first instinct is to not even mention it. But the enemy wants you to despise your oil because he can't steal your oil. Oil in the Bible is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. When they would anoint a king in the Bible, they would anoint the king with oil. It represented God's empowerment. It represents joy and gladness. It's symbolic of the Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost to live inside of us. And so when I talk about this oil, I'm not talking about something that you keep in your pantry I'm talking about something that you have in your heart, the gift God gave you, the people God put in your life, the idea God gave you, the time he gave you, the season that you're in. If I were your enemy and I knew I couldn't take your oil, what would I do instead? I would get you to think that your oil was so little that it wasn't even worth using. And that's why some people sit in church week after week after week month after month after month, year after year after year, and they stay in their deficiency and never realize that what they've got is something. It's not nothing. Our gift is something. Our life is something. Our praise is something. For too long, I've been comparing my oil with yours. My oil might not be as much as yours, but God won't hold me accountable for your oil. We learned this from Elijah. Go look and see if you can see anything in the sky. And the servant came back. Nothing. He told the servant, go look again. Nothing. He told him, go look again. Nothing. Go look again. Nothing. Go look again. Nothing. Go look again. Nothing. You know, this is really getting old. How old would it get to you if you were the one running to the top of the hill to look at nothing? And then finally, by the time you do see something, it's so small, you minimize it. There's a cloud the size of a man's hand. 
Well, it's not the size of the cloud that determines the size of the blessing. It's not the amount of the oil. It's not how smart I am, how well educated I am. It's not even my estimation of myself. If God calls me and chooses me, nothing on earth shall be able to stop me. Check your oil. It might not be much, but it's not nothing. And I think it's harder than ever to feel okay about our oil because we got too many ways to check other people's oil. Whether it's their vacation, you know, where everybody's posting the happiest moments of their vacation this summer, and it's going to make you feel like a crappy parent. It's going to make you question your oil because they're going to all be smiling in that picture. Well, let me tell you something. What happened right before that picture? It was probably almost a divorce. Those kids almost went up for adoption, but they can't put that on the gram. So you need to enjoy your oil. So I'll tell you exactly what the devil is doing. He can't take your gift. He can't take your calling. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind about what he gave you. But if he can get you to think it's so little that you don't use it, he can starve you. You know, I realize that God gave me a ministry. The devil can't take the ministry that God gave me. But if I give up my joy, then I will forfeit my ministry. If I give up my joy, I will forfeit my marriage. The devil can't take my marriage. But if he can get me to despise my oil, like to make me think I'm not a very good husband, or I don't have what it takes to be a dad, then I'll say it's nothing when it's really something. Notice by the end of this passage, the woman has a house full of oil. It was not until she poured the oil that it became more. And when you feel poor, you don't pour because you hold on to what you have. So when you feel like a poor parent, it keeps you from wanting to try. There are things about me and things about you that make us feel insecure and make us say it's nothing when it's really something. But it seems small and it's overshadowed by something that seems so big. When the need seems so big compared to the supply, you call it nothing and you don't use it and so it doesn't multiply. You send the crowds away so they can get something to eat and you give away the opportunities God gave you because it's nothing. It's little stuff. It's not always some big shame that the enemy brings to make you feel like nothing. This is where I always got it wrong. I thought that you had to go through something sexual that caused you this traumatic shame to keep you from really trusting God. Or I thought maybe you had to go through a season of your life, you know, eight years in prison or something like that, and then you would live with regrets. But I found out it is the seemingly insignificant insecurities that make you feel like I'm not a real man or I'm not a real mom. Now I'm yelling at my daughter just like my mom yelled at me, and I'm just repeating the cycle, and it causes you to despise your oil, and that's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants us to use a small little thing to get you to miss your miracle because your miracle is hidden in what you've been overlooking. And the reason you've been overlooking it is because it seems so small to you. And the reason it seems small to you is because you're insecure about what you're not. So he'll work on you until you call it nothing. What do you have to be grateful for? Nothing. Really? Nothing? What are you good at? Nothing? You can ask a group of people what they are really great at, and it'll take them a long time to answer. I wonder why that is. It could be because we're so humble, I guess, or it's because the enemy has messed with us so much because we're all at an adult age and we've gotten so familiar with our deficiency. When you've lived in a deficit for a long time, it overshadows the oil that you do have. He wants you to despise your oil. He wants you to despise the season of life that you're in. He wants you to be thinking about how much time you used to have back before, how much you're going to have when. Meanwhile, the question of the prophet is not what do you wish you had in your house? What do you have left? Because that's what God is going to bless, what you have left. God is going to bless what he gave you. You are his chosen vessel, and the oil you have is the oil you need, and the strengths you have are the strengths you need, and the experiences that you have are the experiences that you need. But notice this, the oil only flows when it is poured. You can pray over it, you can cry over it, you can wish for it, but until you pour it, it will stay one small jar. If the enemy can't take your oil, he will try to get you to stop pouring. And some of you have probably stopped pouring. You got your heart broken. You poured your love into your last relationship and it didn't work out and they left you. 
They hurt you and they turned away from you. So you stop pouring. And when you stop pouring, it stops flowing. You used to encourage people and then you got discouraged and you stopped encouraging. But you need to keep on pouring because the more you pour, the more it's going to flow. Now, we tend to think, I'll pour more when I get more. But the way it works in the order of God is it becomes more as it is poured. Isn't it just like God to command you to pour something that you don't feel like you have enough of? That's a strange instruction. I don't have much. Well, pour it out. It's the weirdest strategy in the world, but it works. As you pour it out, it becomes more. I've tried that thing where you feel sorry for yourself when you're discouraged. I tried that other thing where I encouraged somebody else when I felt discouraged. The first one took me deeper into my deficit and my discouragement. The second one, well, it's the weirdest thing because I didn't feel like I had it to give. I wanted somebody to encourage me. And bitterness will keep you from pouring what you have while you wait for what you want. So then you stay poor, you stay frustrated, you stay stuck, you stay in bitterness. I wonder, was the woman a little disappointed that the prophet told her to pour something? It's frustrating when you have to pour into someone else when you really wish someone would pour into you, yet the more you pour, the more it flows. The devil is so crafty that he will put you in a state where you'll tell yourself, nobody appreciates me, so you'll stop giving yourself, and it will reinforce that self-fulfilling prophecy that quote-unquote nobody appreciates me. They don't appreciate you because you'll stop pouring. And they'll no longer have anything to appreciate about you. I feel that way sometimes when I'm teaching. The devil will tell me that, you know, they really don't care. They're not going to remember this discussion. Now you got to have this sense in your life that I'm not doing it for them, because sometimes you will pour into people and they won't say a word. But they're not your source. I might be pouring into people, but I'm pouring for the Lord. So I can keep pouring if you appreciate me. I can keep pouring if you don't. I can keep pouring if you stay. I can keep pouring if you walk out. I'm so grateful that God kept pouring into me when I seemed unprofitable, and so I got to keep pouring. It said that she kept pouring. I wonder how stupid she felt when she first started pouring. Now, once it starts working, it was probably kind of fun. And I will point out one thing that I thought was kind of funny, how Elisha told her in verse 3, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. And then in verse 5, it says she left him and shut the door behind her and her sons, they brought the jars to her. She made her kids go to the neighbors. One more thing I want to point out, and it's what enabled her to pour. She shut the doors. That's such an important detail in this text because it is what you pour out in private when no one is looking. And a lot of us are so busy praying for more oil, more opportunity, more, 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 and more. But God says, pour, 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 and pour. And the more you pour, the more it flows. You're never going to pour out what you have while you're so busy consulting what everybody else has. You'd be like the woman who came in and poured out that expensive fragrance on the feet of Jesus and all the men around called it a waste. She called it worship because you're always going to feel like it's not enough. And even if you feel like it is enough, you feel like it doesn't matter. Have you had a day like that in the last seven where you felt like this doesn't even matter? Well, shut the door and keep pouring. In fact, sometimes the best thing to do is shut your mouth and keep pouring because the oil only becomes more when it was in motion and the oil only flowed when the vessels were ready. I don't think this week's discussion really, though, is about the oil at all. I think it's about the vessels. Because when Elisha told her to go around to her neighbors, he gave her a very specific type of vessel to request. He said, make sure they're empty. God can't fill what's already full. That's why it's so important that you pour out your pride. That's why it's so important that we pour out our own opinions, selfishness, and worldly desires, and come before the Lord empty. Because when the vessels are ready, the oil will flow. And there's something strange about these vessels that we only learn with a New Testament revelation. This is 2 Kings 4. But if you jump a couple of centuries over to 2 Corinthians 4, you get the full message where Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why would God put something so special in such a cracked vessel? What keeps you from showing up is your cracks and your conflicts. But that is the very place that the blessing flows through. Paul said we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power might be from God, 
not from us. One season in his church, there was a pastor that said he was feeling pretty particularly overwhelmed. He said to his wife that he just didn't feel like he's the pastor that they needed. The reason he said that was because the need was so great and his experience was so small. At this particular point, he had just turned 30, and the church was already about the same size as the town he grew up in. Now, that'll make you stop and pause. That'll make you feel like not enough. It's a very vulnerable feeling. She looked back at him cold-blooded, and she said, You're the one we've got. Well, you're the mom they've got. You're the dad they've got. You're the son they've got, and you're the daughter they've got. You're the one that God chose. You are his chosen vessel, and he chose you not in spite of your cracks, but because of them. That ensures that people will not compliment the vessel. They will value the oil. It is what God put inside of you, but you've got to pour it out. If you've been in a deficit emotionally, spiritually, relationally, or financially, deficits come in many different varieties. But if you are that empty vessel today and you come to the end of yourself, that's the starting place for God's supply to be poured out in your life. And our God shall supply all of your needs according to His glory. Not according to your quantity of oil, but according to His glorious riches. I hope that you would see yourself as a vessel that God is ready to fill. When the vessels are ready, the oil will flow. It's good when you feel empty. It's good when you feel like you're not enough. It's good when you know your need, because then you remember your source. Cracked vessels are where the light shines through. So this week, as we wrap up this discussion on living on a deficit, when you have very little, do you find it harder to pour? Do you find it more difficult to pour into people? When you just don't feel like you have enough? Do you ever feel like what you have is nothing? Do you feel like that you live in a deficit? When you feel like what you have is nothing, how do you react in those moments? Do you live in it and let it define who you are? Or do you make the best of what you've got and try to move forward and pour into other people's lives so that you can be blessed yourself? If I asked you you loved your life, what would your answer be? God didn't create us to be a decoration, but to contain something valuable. You know, thinking about yourself personally, how do you feel about that statement? Do you think when you live in a deficit long enough, does it make you feel like you minimize your supply? Do you just accept that this is the way it is going to be? Do you find yourself sitting in church week after week in your deficiencies and never getting out of them? What do you do to avoid Satan taking your joy? Have you ever poured into someone when you really didn't feel like it? How did you feel later after the fact? Did you feel better or still wrapped up in the deficits? How hard is it for you to stay empty of the bad stuff so God can keep you full of the good stuff? And why does a cracked vessel, such as us, benefit God's kingdom more than a perfect vessel with no imperfections? As we leave this week, I just pray that you would search your life. As the psalm says, search us, O God, search our hearts, search our minds and our souls, the very being of who we are and who you've created us to be. Are we still where you want us to be in this life? Are we still following the path that you've created us for in a time such as this? If you feel like that you're not enough, if you feel like that you're nothing or you have nothing to give, look to the Father. Jesus Christ makes us enough through his death on the cross He is the one that's provided for us, and He has given us that salvation that we can all enjoy as we endeavor and as we push forward towards that eternity and that reward that we're going to have in heaven with Him someday. And along the way, the more people we pour into, the more people we can bring with us. My prayer for you this week is that you would look into your heart and into your soul and allow Jesus to come in and to mend that brokenness, those relational issues that you may have, the emotional times that you're going through when you feel like you want to give up. Jesus is there for you. He wants you to lean on Him and allow Him to pour His oil into you and to fill you up more than you could ever desire. Well, that's all for this week. Hope you guys enjoyed this mini-series on miracles. As we wrap this up, we're going to have something new coming your way next week here on Connecting the Gap. Don't forget you can visit my website, connectingthegap.net. And there you can subscribe and share all the podcast platforms that I'm on. I'm on YouTube and Rumble as well, and also the podcasting app Edify. And please reach out. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, just drop me a note 
If you need a Bible or whatever it may be, I would love to hear from you here at Connecting the Gap. So you can utilize the form on the website or email me at daniel at connectingthegap.net. Well, I'm out of here until next week. Until then, don't forget that God's Word never fails us. God's Word has stood the test of time, and through Jesus' death on the cross, He has connected the gap. You've been listening to Connecting the Gap podcast. I'm Daniel Moore, the host for this podcast, and I personally thank you for listening each week. In this world, there are many disconnects that cause chaos in our lives. This podcast is birthed from the desire to share hope and restoration of the power of the gospel by being transparent and open in our biblical walk with God. Each week, we take a few moments as we navigate God's Word and peer into other people's testimonies and encourage each other to connect the gap. We upload a new audio podcast every Thursday and a video version of it on YouTube and Rumble. We are also on the Christian podcasting app Edify. You can subscribe to our podcast on many of the available podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcast, Deezer, Spotify, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, and many more. We are also available on your Alexa-enabled devices. If you would like to give us feedback or would like to contact our ministry for any reason, including prayer, visit our contact page at www.connectingthegap.net and send us a message. We hope you are blessed by this ministry. This is a production of Connecting the Gap Ministries.